Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jose Rincon, and I am the Artistic Services Manager here at Opera America. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to tonight's Making Connections event, an intimate conversation with Francesca Zambello. Tonight's event is being streamed live on the homepage of the Opera America website. So I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining us online, and thank you for tuning in. <laughs> uh, in order to accommodate and welcome more guests in the future, Opera America plans to break ground in early 2011 for a national opera center right here in New York City, which will open in 2012. The center will include a performance and audition hall, four large rehearsal rooms, nine practice rooms in addition to the Opera America offices and library. Uh, we are excited about this new endeavor and look forward to hosting events like tonight's uh, in the future at the Opera Center. We have two Making Connections events coming up in the month of December. On December 1st, we have Internet Famous Strategies for Promoting and Branding Yourself Online. And on December 15th, we have Stress Management for Opera Artists. <laughs> So you can find more information uh, about those two sessions in the red brochure that was on your chair, uh, also on the Making Connections webpage. Uh, before we get started, if you could please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other handheld devices. The discussion portion of tonight's event will go till about 8 p.m. Afterwards, I hope you'll stay for a glass of wine and some continued conversation. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you. And just welcome everyone. Thank you. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be sitting here with Francesca Zambella, who I have Thank known you. since I had hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I remember that. The Chicago <laughs> coffee years and years yeah. ago. So it's such a pleasure to welcome you Thank to you. the Open America Office. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm very happy to be here with people here and anyone who's online, including my mother, who's home watching on her computer. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the Making Connection series is a series of seminars, discussions that we do about the career development of artists in various parts of the opera field. And of course, tonight we're going to focus on stage direction because, of course, Francesca is one of the nation's, one of the world's great opera stage directors, but also theater directors and other kind of directorial activities. So we'll get there in a second. But I want to focus at first on career development. And I, I know that you. Uh, have been in opera almost your entire career. So reversing, when, when did you first know that opera was what you wanted to do? Well, I, uh, like a lot of people, came to New York uh, right after university. And I knew, I already knew I wanted to be a director. That was what I wanted to do. Uh, I started working in the theater first as a stage manager. I, I liked opera. It wasn't like I loved opera, but I, I enjoyed it. But I was really more interested in theater. And, I worked for a number of different small off-off Broadway theaters and a public theater as a stage manager. And I then uh, became really more interested in opera. I was going to City Opera. I was a standing room at the Met. And I realized that at that time in the late 70s, it felt like theater was so naturalistic and so focused on kind of TV everything and the visuals and, and the way that the way that theater was happening. And so I thought that opera suddenly seemed like it had a much broader palette. And that it had a much, uh, a world that wasn't as naturalistic and realistic and something that you could really look at in a, in a, in a much greater sweep. And I, I had, I have to say, been to the opera so much growing up. I was fortunate that my family, uh, when I was a kid, we moved to Paris and Vienna and London. So I had some exposure to it. but. But it was really at that point where I thought opera really was much more of a director's world and a world where you could tell a big story and you weren't as couched in naturalism and that there were many ways to do it. And so honestly, I, you know, I, I went to Europe. Uh, uh, I was a, an intern, a gopher, uh, an everything. Uh, I, I want to get into that. Because but, but, um, <clears throat> I think for so many artists, and we know that singers can audition. There are competitions and yeah, that's, you have artist programs. For directors, directors yeah. you know, and I know we, we have you know, conductors here too. You know, how, how do you audition when you don't have an orchestra? How do right. you audition if you don't have a okay. show to direct? Right. I, I heard you talking about being a stage manager. Mm -hmm. You went to Europe and did a whole lot of 
activities we want to hear about, but suddenly you were connected to Jean-Pierre Ponel, and it seems like within a very short time you had gone from an awakened interest in opera to uh, apprenticing, in a way, to one of the great masters. And how, how did that happen? Well, I mean, I think that uh, I think that almost anything in the arts, I, I think that apprenticeship is is a viable way of, of making a career. I don't think you can study some of these things. You just you can't. And I, uh, it, it wasn't so quick. It was, uh, I mean, I, I went to Europe for a bit, and then I came back. And at that point, there was government funding. There was something called the National Opera Institute, uh, which is was a in some way a precursor to this organization and they had a thing for people who wanted to be stage directors where you could get a grant for a year uh, I remember very distinctly it was a thousand dollars a month and which is pretty good actually mm -hmm. and I applied and but you had to have directors who would sponsor you and uh, Nathaniel Merrill who was director at the Met at that time sponsor, agreed to be my sponsor and I had managed to you know where I wrote a thousand letters to people and you know nobody answers you it's just like now and he was gracious enough, to, which is why I always answer every letter. Uh, he was gracious enough to answer my letter because I knew him through a wonderful singer named Olive Warfield, who was a great Bess. Uh, she was the first Bess in Europe, and I knew her through a family thing, and so that's how I met him. And he said, I'll sponsor you. And so I got that grant, and that led me to work for him at a number of theaters in this country and abroad. And then I actually... I had worked at the Lyric Opera for him of Chicago. They hired me for a year. And then I went to San Francisco as an assistant director. And then once you get in that track of being an assistant, you, uh, you know, meet directors. And I, I was, Jean-Pierre, uh, of course, directed in San Francisco, and he wanted an assistant in Europe. Uh, I was fortunate, as I said, growing up, I learned a number of languages and was, and he always loved Americans. He loved American directors. He loved to American singers. And he needed an assistant in, uh, in Italy for something like next month. And thank you, Sarah Billinghurst. She said, you know, Cheska is the person for you. I went. I remember I met him. I had an interview with him. He was living at the Pythian on the Upper West Side at that time, directing something at the Met. And we had an interview, and he said, you have the job. I'll see you at La Fenice on this day in three weeks. <laughs> and it was like, boom. Uh, there I was. So, and that really was, you know, he became vital to my career uh, for about eight years. I was his assistant. And uh, I was very fortunate because I, I, I was fort I was lucky in the right place at the right time. You know, I had him, and then... I also, at the same time, started directing at a very small company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, let's, let's pause right yeah, there. Sorry. Let's, let's pause right there. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, Francesca is just telling the whole story. Right, yeah. Okay, okay sorry. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, this part's kind of boring. I mean, it's like, you know, how do you start? I, mean, you, I just want to point out to a couple yeah. things. One is you, a big premium on languages. Yes. That knowing languages really helped you get started fast in opera. You can't work in opera if you can't talk. You can't, directing, you know, when you said, what can you do? You have to talk. That's how you get jobs. You know, when you first get your first jobs, you talk your way, you bullshit your way into people hiring. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely, I had a number of intendants and general directors who hired me because I could talk in their language. Mm -hmm. And that was truthfully how it happened. And the, the other piece that you brought up, the N NOI, the National Opera Institute, yes. which no longer exists, it closed in 1990, and many of its archives and resources are here in Opera America. Right. Um, we have our director designer showcase, mm -hmm. but we don't have a year-long apprentice program like NOI. Right. Um, without that kind of NOI program, uh, how might you have done it differently? Well, I mean, I think that I think that really the throwing yourself in front of directors and 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 being an intern is it. I mean, and, and I do always take on. I feel very proud to have nurtured along some very good directors, and uh, and you, you have to be an apprentice. I mean, you have to be willing to do the Xeroxing. You have to be willing to now make the, you know, the Excel charts. I mean, back then when I was there, it was like, go be the mimeograph person, get the coffee. <laughs> uh, and now it's like, uh, you have to be willing to put up with the drudge work. I think, and I think just being in a rehearsal is a, an invaluable lesson watching people rehearse <coughs> and being in you know the go the gopher person and then you suddenly get to the second assistant and the first assistant and then 
the opera has this bizarre thing of revivals, which theater doesn't have, where you then go and direct a revival, and then, I mean, that's what happened mm -hmm. to me, actually, is I directed some revivals for Jean-Pierre, and those theaters said, oh, you did a good job, this person canceled, can you do this new production, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think that it has to be done. But you have to have some skill set, and I think that being a stage manager was invaluable in uh, really being versed in all aspects of production. Uh, and count, you know, paralleled with the languages and having an understanding of, of the repertory. I mean, you, you, the good thing about being a director or a singer is that, you know, you can always make yourself better. You can always study. You can always learn. You know, when you don't have a job, which I remember certainly in my 20s a lot, just learning repertory. And, uh, you know, I did, was a musician as a kid, so you, you have to be a musician to direct. That's the other thing. You know, it all it comes from the music, so you've got to be a musician of some sort. A score reading musician, or someone who just really understands music orally? Well, I think you have to be score reading. You know, the score's your Bible. Uh, I mean, the score's your road map. I mean, you you interpret a road map now. You know, we, we don't have a GPS. You know, I mean, you, 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 the score is where everything starts. The words and the notes are all that we are given the same way that the conductors and the singers are only given that, and we have to interpret that in a way that has that has our own voice. And even though... Yeah, no, you have to, I mean, like, you have to play the piano, mm -hmm. or I play the flute, the clarinet, the bass clarinet, the piano, you know, it's, you, you've got to do those things. And even though opera companies have tight budgets these days, and directors still have assistants, that the assistant yes. director position is still one with a population of people running around. Yes, yes. they are still out there. Uh, how else do people direct? I mean, I did also, uh, I mean, I directed Cosi Fantute in the church that is across the street from Juilliard, the Church of the Good Shepherd, I think it's called. That was like practically the first thing I ever directed, and that was a bunch of friends who were singers, and I got together, and I directed Cosi in that. That was my Lincoln Center debut, I like <laughs> <laughs> um, And then, so you created your own? Yeah, I created my own, and I mean, and that truthfully was then at the skylight, it's very, you know, I think directors, you are in essence also a producer. You have to create your work. You know, you have to, you know, no composers, no librettists, you know, make stories. I mean, that's part of your job. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just sit on your heels and wait for something to happen. So let's talk about, so skylight. So there you are, you're assisting jean pierre Bonnel, you're remounting a couple of his productions. Uh, Europe, Paris, Vienna, Fenice, <laughs> skylight. Yeah. How did that <laughs> Well, I mean, I was still, when I was working for Jean-Pierre, I sort of kept a foot in the door at, as a, an assistant to the San Francisco Opera. It was under the, you know, many of the great years of Mr. McEwen and, uh, you know, who was, he was very important to me. He actually gave me a couple of shows, uh, two, where he, I did like a student cast of Traviata, which then uh, led to, I, I think, I'll get to the Scott, I just want to say one thing, is that I was directing the student cast performances of La Traviata in San Francisco. We started super titles, I wrote them, and the receptionist, this has had the best way I ever got a job. Uh, an opera company in Colorado, the Colorado Opera Festival, was doing a production of Tosca that summer, and they called the, re the San Francisco Opera because they were trying to get through to some director that they thought was there. And the receptionist answered the phone and said, oh, that director isn't here. But there is another director here who's very good. Her name is Francesca Zemba. <laughs> <laughs> this was the receptionist. Her name is Olivia, God rest her soul. You should, talk to, you should talk to her. I kid you not. I was walking right past the reception area, and, and she said, this guy's in Colorado. They need a director this summer for production of Tosca. I told him you were really good. This was the reception. Mm -hmm. I talked to the guy. <laughs> he hired me. Um, and then, actually, the Skylight, which uh, is a wonderful theater in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The Skylight Opera, it was at that point, it was called the Skylight Comic Opera. I renamed it with my <laughs> co-artistic director. I have a tradition of that. Um, Stephen Wadsworth, it uh, became the Skylight Opera Theater. And I went there and actually got a job, convinced the guy, same thing, talked to, at that point, it was Colin Cabot, who was the executive director that he should hire me to direct, and so I made my directing debut there, directing uh, the Macropolis Case. I always like to say it was with two pianos and a kazoo, because the <laughs> kit was so small. And, uh, and then I ended up 
long story short, becoming the artistic director with Stephen Wadsworth for seven years, we ran the company. And it was an invaluable parallel to being there sort of half a year and then working for Jean-Pierre abroad. So I had this amazing uh, balance between being able to really refine my skills as a director and work and then uh, work abroad and work as an assistant. I mean, it, being an assistant is actually, it's, it's the best way to learn. Um, if, when you think back to your time with, with, with Mr. Pinnell, any particular advice or learning piece he that gave, you still He gave, he doled out a lot of advice, uh, good mm -hmm. advice, I think. Advice. I mean, for directors, I mean, I see just now one of my esteemed colleagues in the audience, and uh, I, I think that, you know, he said things which this may not mean anything to other people, but he, he always said, if you don't fix it in the rehearsal room with the performer, it will never get fixed. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's very true. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, and then he had a couple other choice things, was he said, you have got to finish your work at the piano dress rehearsal, uh, because chances are you won't get to fix it after that. Mm -hmm. And he, a lot about things about, you know, push to get the cast you want, uh, no matter, you know, fight about that no matter what. And, and it is true, you know, casting is a, in, in theater it just goes without saying that you, the director, are, you know, the voce suprema who's in the cast. In opera it tends to be this committee, depending on the conductor's involvement or the artistic <laughs> administrator who does the casting, or, and, 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 and you, you can't do a good job if you don't have the right cast. Mm -hmm. So he was always very adamant about that. And, um, and then, you know, the most important, the, the sort of liquid gold that no one understands outside of the business, and many people in the business don't get, is that you need rehearsal time. It's all about rehearsal time. You know, you, you can direct anything, you know, if you have the rehearsal time. You don't need a big budget. You don't need a big production. You need time to rehearse with the conductor present, with the singers, and to rehearse the piece in order, that was the other thing he always said, never go out of order. And in opera we have this terrible habit, people are like, oh, we can rehearse act two and we can rehearse act one, it doesn't make sense. You've got to go in order from the top, the way the composer wrote it, the way the librettist wrote it, you've got to tell the story from the beginning. Um, it, interesting, a couple of things I, I yeah. did want to emphasize. One is that you just said you would take time over scenery. Absolutely, no question, and I have many times in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so, Cut it back, cut it simple, just give you enough right. time to really Right, yeah, I mean, I've it. also been known to do a lot of very big productions, but uh, but ultimately, I, I, the, and though some of them that have been big where I haven't had rehearsal time, they were bad. Mm -hmm. They were really bad. They were disasters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna ask you any names, but. That's not. <laughs> but you know, that is a problem. You know, if you don't rehearse, it won't be good. You know, it's like, if the music's not right, it's like sort of an, it's like the music's gotta be right, and you've gotta have rehearsal time. And the singers have to be able to sing it. Like, don't think that you can make a bad singer able to sing something. You can't. <laughs> you just, you can't. It's impossible. Get people who can sing the parts. Get the person you want in the part. And chances are you're, you're you know, that's, it might go well then. You know, in, in, in your, you know, story so far, and people skills is really important. I mean, you're, oh, you're, yeah, you're being, you know, really, you know, <laughs> friendly with the right. receptionist and you're being able to talk to people and, and, and promote yourself in a way that makes them pay attention, makes them give you what you need as an apprentice so that you can go forth. Um, any advice to aspiring stage directors on that kind of people skill piece of it? Well, be nice to everyone on the way up because you'll meet them on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You haven't been on the way down, so how do you know? No, but I, I do think that you know I have seen colleagues I have seen people be rude to people, and you know it just doesn't pay off. It just, you, it's just not good. And it also, it, it doesn't help to be quiet and in the corner. Well, it doesn't. It, you know, you have to create an atmosphere in the rehearsal room or the theater, which uh, is infectious. Which has to, people do their best work. I think. You know, there's some directors who work on the scary factor, on the dictator factor. And I think you have to create an environment where everyone can give of themselves the best, where they can do, you know, you want, you want people to do their best. So you're not going to win any points by being like, 
you know, so often, you know, there's the young singer in the cast and there's all the accomplished people. So, like, everybody picks on the young singer because they can't pick on the accomplished people. Well, you should focus on the accomplished people because they often need the most work. Uh, you know, and don't be mean to the person who's, you know, ironing the clothes. It's just they might end up being a great costume designer in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Or they might just be doing that in 10 years, but you need them to do that well so that it looks good. I mean, it's just, it's, it's basic people skills. You know, business teaches us that. We should operate like that in some ways, I think. Here you are at, at Skylight. Right. Seven years, going back and forth and assisting Quinnell. Um, the break. When did you step from the assistant and the kind of regional opera creative director mm -hmm. to someone who began to have a national and international reputation? Well, I mean, at that time, uh, I mean, I did, uh, Pinnell's other advice was, uh, and I think it's different now for directors, it's different, the economy is different. Uh, he said, don't ever do a production if you didn't work with a designer to create <laughs> the aesthetic of that production. And you know, at Skylight, that was true. You know, our budgets for new productions were fifteen hundred dollars. I remember it very clearly. And uh, but you know, you at least could you could put your ideas on stage. And so, in terms of bigger breaks, I was very fortunate. A couple general directors, David Gottley, uh, foremost, was uh, I had been an assistant. I had revived something there for somebody, and. Uh, uh, it always sounds like we're like lifting up a dead person when we say goodbye. It was a production of The Tales of Hoffman that I had, you know, been an assistant on and redirected, and and uh, he had a can he had a cancellation. You know, for directors, it often is like singers. Somebody cancels. You know, a director canceled. It was a production of Fidelio. He called me. He said, if you can come up with a good idea on a budget of, I remember it was twenty five thousand dollars. Uh, which now suddenly is a lot of money, back then it was no money. I mean, it's just, it's ironic the way it works. Um, and uh, so I did it, it was with Hildegard Barons. it was a wonderful product, Julius Rudell conducted, it was a new production of Fidelio, it was like six months from then, and I did it. And then in Europe I had a very similar thing, I had done something for Pinnell, it was uh, Rossini's Otello, and uh, La Fenice, somebody canceled, and then they hired me to direct uh, Beatrice di Tenda. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is a case of, you know, right place, right time, and you do a good job, and, and you then hopefully will get hired by somebody else. But as a director, you always have to go out and sell yourself. I mean, Marilyn Horne said something great once, which she, she said, it doesn't matter how, you know, well known you get, in her case she said how famous you are, you know, you're only as good as the last thing you did. And that's the thing in the theater, everybody says that, you're only as good as what you just did. And, and I think it's true. But anyway, those were two very good breaks that led to, you know, in Italy it led to, I worked in Italy in the 80s and early 90s, six or seven months of the year, I did many productions in 15 theaters in Italy. And then also you, you established a, a really good relationship with Ugal in Paris, so that yes. was another kind of home for you. Yeah, I mean, Ugal, who was the intendant in, at the Paris Opera in Geneva, I worked mm -hmm. for him first in Geneva, uh, I directed several productions there, and then when he went to Paris, I directed, uh, I think, 12 operas for him there. Uh, so, I mean, and I had a great relationship with Covent Garden. Um, you know, it's about relationships with theaters. I mean, and that's something, again, as a director, you forge relationships with the general directors. They're like producers, you know, they're the people who are gonna hire you and they, and you you represent their taste or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I assume that you build a relationship with the theater too, with its technical personnel and its production personnel. Uh, I mean, that's an integral part of, I think, a job as a director is that you must you know, you're most important, you, you can't do your job without a good relationship with the head of the costume department and the technical director and, you know, the administrative people. You're, you're the center of the planning wheel, but you need everyone around you to be on your page. And, and I think that, you know, directors, we're only as good as our stage manager, our TD, you know, wh whoever is there, you know, creating that work with you. It, it's, it's vital. And you mentioned that you have done fifteen hundred dollar productions at Skylight, and then the gargantuan productions. Right? You've done Troyan, War and Peace, in the middle of a ring cycle right now. So you're real, you're getting the big ones. Yeah. Um, they're longer. Yeah, they're um, longer. <laughs> they're long. <laughs> is they're the, long. Is there a, a a new set of challenges, a unique set of challenges in tackling 
a gargantuan pieces that you don't experience in doing just one of the regular records. Well, I think the gargantuan pieces are, of course, they're a great challenge for a director. You, you have to, uh, you know, I'm attracted to the, the big story. I mean, I think that something has to be the big thing to tell. You know, when we're given, uh, you know, the Mussorgsky or Berlioz or Wagner, those pieces, you know, they have a huge message behind them, often a huge political story, a huge... Uh, emotional aspect to them, and I find it, you know, those are thrilling to be given. So you, 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 you need to, you know, have something you want to say about them and how you want to tell that story. And you also want to be able uh, to, you know, you have to plan them out. They take an enormous amount of planning and preparation, and it, you can't get your ideas on the stage if you don't plan it, because often they have big choruses, a lot of supers, ballet, you know, you've got to work all that out beforehand. And am amplify a little bit what you mean by plan or work it out. Um, you're at, at your studio just thinking about minute by minute, where am I going to move them, how am I Absolutely. Well, I mean, your collaborators are, of course, your designers, your set, costume, lighting, and then nowadays projection designer is often part of it, choreographer. Uh, and you spend, uh, I mean, I know for some people in the audience this is you know, obvious, but for others who don't, just bear with me a second. That, you know, the planning process of a big opera, you know, let's say the Mad Hires You or, you know, Covent Garden, you know, you're, you're often planning the design several years in advance. Uh, and you, you, you must work it out because it's a, it's a financial responsibility. Somebody is entrusting you with a very large amount of money to work out what that production is going to look like. And it might be in their repertory for 15 or 20 years. It might be a one-off. You know, you, you know what it is beforehand. And, and I think that you, you know, you generally, we work with the designers, the model process, the designs, costumes, all that. And then you go through, it's like if you built a house. You know, you go to them, they say it's too expensive, go back and make it this much. So then you go back and you have to rethink things. You've got to find creative solutions to financial issues always. And that's a give and take process which can take a year. I mean, today I spent an hour cutting costumes for something. Uh, at a big theater, and uh, it's like, okay, that's what we're going to do. Um, and But you have to plan all that out in advance. It takes enormous advanced planning. Uh, I always think that as a director, I feel like about 75% of my job is before day one of rehearsal. Uh, day one of rehearsal. Day one of rehearsal is like diving in, and you're just, it's physical. Before that, it's, it's, it's creative time, emotional time, it's thinking time. Uh, and, and you can't do it all in one go. You know, you must plan things out over a long time. You know, the, they, it needs an arc. It needs, a, it needs time, gestation. And, you know, when it comes to your, you, you work in Cooperstown, when it comes to batting averages, you, you, you're a Hall of Famer <laughs> in terms of successes <laughs> versus strikeouts. Well, I don't know. I've had some real flunkers. So. <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah. is there a unifying theme to what goes wrong when something's a clunker? What should you watch out for? Well, I, I think that clunkers have all been, they've been my fault, uh, for sure. Uh, it it's, was misguided generally from the first steps with the designer. Uh, you know, because that's the environment that you're creating for a piece. So the, if you've screwed that up, you, you don't realize it until often until you're into it. Um, and then you, you know, unfortunately in opera there's often no turning back. In theater it's much easier to turn back and rethink and rejigger things. And, you know, the financial stakes aren't often as high. Uh, so, again, it just goes to, to me it's been that I did, that I had a bad idea or the designer had a, and we, the collaboration went south. You know, you, you feel when things are going well. I, I think it's very, it's very physical. You, feel like, okay, we're on the right track. Uh, also, I've been on the right track and it has gone, not worked out too, but mm -hmm. I think the clunkers are all afterwards, you're able to look back and, and see, but you can't see when you're in the middle of a bad mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. you, nobody can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the difference between theater and opera, and you are someone who has worked in theater and works in theater and opera, and in commercial and non-commercial. So right. um, you really have a, a broad experience. and. You know, I think a lot of people who do work in the nonprofit or in opera just stay very yeah. much in that niche, yeah. and yet you cross back and forth. And, and do you feel that the 
the lines between our subsectors of music, theater, and theater are blurring, or is it just that you boldly step across those lines? No, I think they're blurring. I mean, I think everyone who works in these different genres would recognize that you know, opera and music theater uh, are very much the same. I mean, it was interesting, the NEA used to call them together, which was, uh, this morning, I'm not name dropping, but this morning I was with Hal Prince, and you know, we, he was lamenting, you know, I know that sounded like it, but you know, he was lamenting, you know, why it used to be that it was opera, music, theater, and, and, made it that right, and he was the one who made it that way, and that now it's separated. And I think that we're all working, you know, we're asking for this incredible level of theatricality in productions, uh, a high level of, of acting now, particularly, of course, with the marriage of technology. Uh, music, in terms of contemporary music now, when you look at the composer generation now, most of them are swaying uh, between, you know, Tom Kitt sounds operatic, Michael John Lacusa, uh, Ricky Ian Gordon. Uh, I've commissioned Janine Tesori and Tony Kushner to write an opera this summer at Glimmerglass. Uh, you know, these are, they're all composers that, who have worked in, or who came from a classical background and then went into musicals. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, for us to create our American language, we're a new country. You know, we, we, we you know, we're 200 years old plus a bit. We're still finding our own American vocal language mm -hmm. uh, and musical language. And I think that that's, you know, that, and then I think that that's why I think musicals are a part of that and, and that is what is opera in a way, our opera. What is it that you have <coughs> learned in opera that you've brought into your th theater work and your commercial, non-commercial theater work? What is it from theater that you've brought into your opera work? Have, have you found that you, have an, a, as an artist, have grown because of this well, crossing think, back and yeah, forth? I think that the more diversity any artist can have, you get better. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, if you're a writer and you write fiction and then write nonfiction and then write essay, you know, it informs it. You know, a, a musician, I think that it's healthy when people do all kinds of music. I think as a director, yes, I mean, I'm con I feel constantly like I'm learning. I mean, I'm, I feel like you have to always be learning and be challenging yourself to be better. Uh, you know, there's always, there's always something new to learn. I'm definitely on a big learning curve right now in a new job, but, but I think that as a director, you, I find that I always take from what I just did and bring to the next, mm -hmm. very much so. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to move on to a little bit of your, your new job. Right. And if we look across uh, the American opera landscape right now, if there's a subset of our opera companies that are doing better than the others, it's the festivals that there is something about the festival structure, the festival experience, that is more successful than some of the traditional one opera a month companies through the, the winter months. What is it about the festival experience? You've had experience with Brigance, you're running. Glitters. Yeah, I know, I've worked in a lot of festivals. What's, what's special about the well, festival Well, I mean, experience? I think that the, the festival, just from the audience point of view, uh, and I do think a lot about the audience and, and what we should be giving them, it is about the fact that they're not going to work every day, that they're there to experience music and culture and theater in a different way. So I always think that you know, that's like the most important mindset about a festival. The other thing is, is people, they want something different than their normal life. And I don't mean like they shouldn't be you know, subscribing to the New York Philharmonic and the Met or something. I just mean that it's, it's the chance for something new. And I think that that's why Festivals generally uh, tend to hopefully entice a, a, a new audience as well as a traditional audience. And, and I mean, that's what enticed me actually to Glimmerglass was the fact that it was a festival situation and not an annual situation. Because I think that my colleagues out there who are running companies in, let's say, second tier cities are doing an incredible incredibly difficult job right now, and I just, my hats go off to them, like big time. And certainly with the festival, the existence of the repertoire in such close proximity, you know, where you can see three pieces in a weekend, four yeah. pieces in a weekend, yeah. that, that you can be more adventuresome in the way the styles of the pieces, the periods of the pieces intersect. Yeah, kind of absolutely. I mean, you, you have more, you don't have to do, you know, the standard repertory only, and mm -hmm. I think not to dump on the standard rep. And I know that's a big discussion that a lot of companies are having, like 
some audiences are saying, oh, well, we don't want to see another Rigoletto. And then the new people who've never seen Rigoletto are going, oh my god, that was so incredible. <laughs> so it's like, how do you balance that? And I think in a festival, it's, it's a little bit easier because we don't have that pressure of we have to do you know, Puccini. But we want to do Puccini. You know? But it's like finding a new way to do Puccini. And you, you've mixed new works in standard repertoire in your own directing career. Yeah, I mean, I directed 25 world premieres. And, you know, the... That's like a badge. <laughs> <laughs> a wound or a badge. A badge, a badge, a badge. The, it must be so different where there is no performance history, where there is no recording, where you really, you have to be yeah. a musician to really right. hit the score. Do you, do you particularly enjoy doing new works? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think we all now, uh, I mean, I love new works. I love the process of working with composers and librettists uh, and the, just the development process. I think that, you know, it's all about that. That's like even more exciting than being handed a new production because you are evolving something from scratch and you are really, the fact that you have a living composer or writer there in rehearsal is vital. I mean, in the theater, you're used to that, the, the, the playwright is alive. Um, but in this case, uh, I think in opera, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's incredibly gratifying. It's not to say it's not also frustrating. I mean, I won't make it like Pollyanna. I mean, I've had some big rows with some composers. But you've also been a dramaturg for pieces. Yes, for a number of pieces. I mean, I think I, I think the drama, the word dramaturg is always a very tricky word because uh, as a director, you are naturally inherently a dramaturg, but sometimes it's just drawing focus to the fact that you're working with the the creative, the creators on it. Have you been a dramaturg on a piece where you were not the stage director? Uh, no. More than one or two of those? No, I don't think so. So you've always been... No, I mean, I've helped, I've been called in on, on a number of occasions uh, to be you a silent to, to contributor. Do, to do what? To help, um, to help the creative team focus their efforts better, uh, you know, and to help, to be a sounding board. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been called in a number of times on that, mm -hmm. to help them work out uh, story problems, music problems, transition problems, uh, just uh, troubleshooting, saying, you know, do you, you know, you, uh, that's not going to work, or, you know, maybe you would want to rethink that. And so I've done that on a number of projects. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. indeed, you know, in, in some of our own convenings, that so many composers are so well schooled in composition, but composers yeah. generally don't go through well, they don't, theater pr programs. Yeah. I mean, they don't get the chance to write a lot of pieces. So I think that, I mean, I think it's better that when you, so many of these commissions, I think they should be for smaller pieces. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, to, to hand a composer, how many times in their life is a composer going to be given the opportunity to write a complete opera? Very few, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's one of the, quirky things in our system that, that we're asking people to write an entire evening. You know, the onus of sustaining an entire evening is hard. You know, even, I mean, as a director, you're thinking constantly, oh my God, you know, something's got to happen here, or something, sh something shouldn't happen here. And, you know, you're s asking people to pay attention to what you're doing for three hours. And if you're the composer, that's a lot of, mm -hmm. that's an incredible responsibility to be able to sustain that. And that's, I think that younger composers or first-time people, they should come into it with their toe in the pond not quite so deeply. I want to come back to Glimmerglass. You've adjusted yeah. the name of the company. OK, now I do want to say that since I have some board members here, I'm very grateful that some board members are here. We have not officially changed the name. We have <laughs> changed the name in the world of the press and marketing uh, to the Glimmerglass Festival because I wanted to really define what it is, the fact that it is a festival. Um, I also wanted to broaden the repertory there. Is this part where I can talk about Glimmer Glass yes. for a second? Yes, you can. Okay, good. All right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a walking salesperson. I'm really a travel agent for that area as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted that it would be a, a festival situation, which meant, uh, as I said, broadening the repertory. Uh, I have added to our normal offerings, and normal there doesn't mean normal because they've always done imaginative programming and, and, and always new productions, that I wanted to do a classic American musical every season uh, without sound enhancement, uh, with a full orchestra, large chorus, big voices, so that we could hear these pieces the way that many of them were composed, and we don't hear them like that anymore. 
And there's more than that in Europe. I just came back yes. from a meeting in, in Munich, the yeah. Europeans. And it's amazing how many musicals they do. There are more musicals yeah. on the European stages than the American stages. Right yeah. now, definitely. Most, uh, I mean, and I've done some of them, yeah. so I know. You know, there are, there are a lot of opera companies and uh, Stadt theaters in Germany that are doing musicals. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And some of now, you know, Chatelet has had great experience with it. And uh, I, I think that, you know, we, you know, we're so well placed to be doing those. So many of our great opera singers started life by singing musicals in high school and college. That's what they did. That's why they fell in love with it. And then some teachers said, you know, you really should try to study opera. And uh, I mean, that this summer at Glimmer Glass, we're doing Annie Get Your Gun with Debbie Voigt, who is one of our greatest sopranos, certainly, and, and uh, Rodney Gilfrey, a noted, noted American baritone, and Jake Gardner. Uh, and the rest of the cast will be a mix of music theater people and young singers in our program. Um, so I'm very excited about making a festival, adding that. We're adding a, a number of uh, other sort of secondary performances, uh, concerts, cabarets, a whole series called Meet Me at the Pavilion. In, in, at the, I was going to ask, where yeah. are you doing so? Uh, at, there's a thing called the Thaw Pavilion, a, a secondary building which we're zhuzhing up a lot, uh, so <laughs> putting a little stage in it, so that we have, I, I want people to use this this site as a destination. It's an incredibly beautiful location. Uh, spectacular grounds uh, on a lake, Lake Otsego, so that I want people to come there and picnic and then take in something at the pavilion, you know, an hour-long piece where you can hear Nathan Gunn, Debbie Boyd, Rodney Gilfrey, the, all the young artists, a lot more lectures, uh, adding things like question and answers after a lot of performances, just things to make people stay on our grounds. Uh, while I'm on it, I'll just keep going mm -hmm. for a second. May I? Uh, uh, we've uh, forged a very strong relationship with their number of mu museums there. Of course, the Baseball Hall of Fame, which I'll talk about in a second, but uh, there's a wonderful museum called the Fenimore Museum, so they're doing art exhibits that parallel what we're doing. For example, we're doing a new work this year called Later the Same Evening that's inspired by five hop paintings by Hopper, by John Busto and Mark Campbell. They're doing a Hopper exhibit at the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, Annie Get Your Gun is a natural calling to a great uh, showing of Native American art. Annie Get Your Gun is kind of the lowbrow side Indian, and then we have the Native American art uh, at the museum. And then things like joining with the Baseball Hall of Fame so that you can go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, get a discount, come to us with your ticket. Um, I mean, just to encourage more of the fact that that area as a festival is, is a destination. Upstate New York, I mean, I'm in a room, I think, with many New Yorkers. You know, I'm definitely on the page of get in your car instead of dealing with the airport right now. Um, and see this incredible state. And, uh, and we're, we have a... I think a phenomenally beautiful location, a great historical sense of Fenimore Cooper, uh, the, you know, all of the wonderful painters of that area, the Hudson Valley School of Painters, the sort of rich tradition of that area, and we have a lot going on. We have 40 plus performances, plus 20 of these other events, yeah. plus lectures. So we're actually at the Metropolitan Opera, the largest producer of opera in the state of New York. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a few more minutes, and I always like to take questions from our guests. So, um, are, there any, are there any questions for Francesca? Does anybody come in online? No, we, we haven't. We haven't <laughs> okay, done that. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, right. They don't stream back at okay. us. A any questions stream for, stream. for Francesca? Yes. Uh, what's out there in terms of new work next year and the year after and the year after that? Uh, you mean in the broad sense or in, in the world that I'm in? Uh, I go to that. At Glimmerglass, well, this summer at Glimmerglass, as I said, we've got a two one acts, one about Hopper and Janine and Tony's piece is about is based on an is called a night with a, in a blizzard in Marblehead, Mass. The short title is Blizzard, um, and it is about a moment in the life of Eugene and Carlotta O'Neill. So it's an evening about two great American artists told through music. Um, we are looking at other new work possibilities. I can't promise anything right now, um, but I, it is definitely on my radar and something I believe in. Um, I personally am directing a new work, not there, but uh, in San Francisco in 2011, which I can't say they're going to announce it very soon, but that's a big new commission of a new work. Uh, and I'm a 
strong advocate for, for living composers and living writers. I believe very much that we have to, we have to, as I said before, we have to create our own, you know, we have to create our own myth. We don't have it yet. Uh, our history still is yet to be truly laid out, I think, in terms of music. It's a big frontier still. So I'm doing what I can. I'm really trying, and I'm, I'm an advocate for it. Other questions? Yes. yes Are you interested in, um, to enlarge the audience reaching North American countries? Am I interested in reaching other North American countries? Yeah, like Mexico. Like Mexico? Yes, actually one of my great collaborations was with Daniel Catan, Mexican composer. Uh, and I certainly am very interested in you know, reaching more in Mexico and more in Canada. Um, actually, Glimmer Glass is working on a co-production with a Canadian company. Because I'll send you a letter. You'll send me a letter. Are you a composer or a director? No, I'm a producer, but uh -huh. the, the musician, the composer, is the leading uh, Mexican composer. Oh, bring it on. And, and we know the, I'll send you the letter. And we know that Cheska answers her letters. Right. Um, <laughs> other questions? It's a quiet group. It is, yeah. yes. Down front. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, that you said that, what's an American opera, a new American opera look like to you? Um, you know, the, the opera for the frontier, opera for the for this new country. What, how, uh, or, or maybe another way to say this, like, how does mm -hmm. opera need to change in order to uh, embrace larger audiences today? Well, I, I definitely, something more in, contemporary? you know, in the larger audiences, I'm definitely not in agreement with a number of my colleagues. Um, I believe that we should be doing work that audiences want to hear, want to see, want to see again. Uh, I think we should be telling stories that relate to us, uh, that are our own myths, our own language, our own, uh, you know, whether, I mean, uh, opera's based on films. I, I'm, you know, I, I prefer original subjects. Uh, but I think if it's going to sell because it's something that an audience knows, then let's try it. I mean, I'm definitely all in the in the make the audience come school, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that anything that we could do to make them come see it, then we should be doing. But I do think we should be drawing more on ourselves and the stories that we tell. And that's not to say that a lot of them aren't already doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and a lot of people are, but it's not everybody is, and a lot of people are writing things that I think that's just never going to get done more than once, so why bother doing it? You know, it has to, you know, it's a lot of money to put on an opera. It's not just the production, it's like the copying costs. I don't, you know, people don't realize how expensive a commission is. It's so expensive. In, in bringing up yeah. the get the audience to come, and, <clears throat> you know, having just been in Europe and you going back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, the, the European style of stage direction, of production style that um, is more updated, more contemporary, more theatrical in some ways, but also more foreign to an American sensibility. Lots of times Americans see some of the operas in Germany or some German productions come here, and there's a level of discomfort with that style of opera production. Yeah, I mean, isn't that kind of changing, though? I mean, it feels like... I mean, uh, it depends on where you're talking about. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so it's so hard to generalize that, and you know that term of Euro trash is thrown around. Mm -hmm. So it just it just doesn't mean anything anymore. We have our own lot of trash out there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I personally more. I mean, I have very strong taste, and now of course in being in a more of a producer position for part of my life. You know, I'm interested in a certain style of theater, a certain truthfulness, a certain uh, sense of strong storytelling, and, and I think that, you know, if it doesn't have those qualities, then I don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, I, I think that day, I think Europe is having a big awakening now mm -hmm. as they're having the economic uh, woes that we have had, so there's a lot of cutback on all that, mm -hmm. and I think they're actually going to fall in line more with where we are, in the, I think, in the next few years. When does the Glimmer Glass season open this year? Glimmer Glass opens on July 2nd with Carmen, directed by my wonderful colleague, Ann Bogart, mm -hmm. who I consider one of our great American directors, a, a living treasure director, and it will be in the 
dialogue version of Carmen because I wanted to connect to musicals. Uh, and then we follow along with Medea by Carabini uh, in Italian, which some people were like, oh, why isn't it in French? But I came to know the opera through the Callas recording mm -hmm. and felt that, that the piece, it's so, such a incredibly over-the-top piece that I thought it should be in Italian. <laughs> uh, it's really as simple as that. And then the double bill, which I mentioned, and Annie, get your gun. And I will very much look forward to welping, welcoming all of you and everybody who's out there as well. Uh, please come this summer to Glimmerglass, the Glimmerglass Festival, from July 2nd to August 22nd. Uh, whether it's just to enjoy our amazing surroundings, see one of our events at the Athenian Pavilion, partake in a lecture series or see a performance. And of course, there are three weekends when you can see all four shows. Well, I know that everyone here will join me in first thanking you for being with us tonight and wishing you the very best of luck in your first evening of Glory Glass. Thank you. and come say hello to Cheska. And again, thank you so much for being here.